Now the parents are going to actually be able to have a much more direct say in the genetic component that makes us who we are. You're listening to Good Is In The Details. I'm Gwendolyn Dolsky. And I'm Rudy Sallow. And this is the podcast where we learn what we didn't know we didn't know in the spirit of Socrates. It's amazing how well that still rolls off of your tongue. I, <laughs> I mean, and you know, technically I'm acting these days and practicing lines for some <laughs> reason that still just doesn't roll off my tongue. I still kind of flub it up. I think I might need some genetic re-engineering, which is oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good segue into this yes, first show okay. of season three. Yes. And just a moment before we say something about that, I just want to thank everybody who's supporting the show. The reviews, the DMs, the emails, everything has just been spectacular. I mean, just to think we started this in 2019. I came to you with this idea of a podcast and you were on board. And where we are now, we're nearly at 80 episodes, a third season, and I think 230 five-star reviews. So thank you, still, thank you, thank it's you. still probably top 1.5% of podcasting, <laughs> if not 1.5 four considering we might we might be in the upper echelon of the three millions of the podcasts uh, Gwen I know this is amazing and I also I normally say this at the end but I want to say it now is that if you want more of good is in the details um, you can support us on patreon at patreon.com slash good is in the details and we have I'll link it in the show notes but we also have also some good stuff for you if you sign up for it some merch uh, some free merch, books some free music sign, sign up if you enjoy the show and you're loving it and you're like, wow, how can I support them? Patreon would definitely. We got a book club and extra content for you to listen to. Okay, so let's get to our guest. Let's get to our guest. Genetic engineering with Dr. Michael Bess of Vanderbilt University. He's in the history department. And what is really cool about this is that he's in the history department, but his book is on genetic engineering and it brings together many disciplines and many things for us to think about. So we've got science, we've got history. We've got some philosophy and really- We, we what, have uh, fertility. Don't forget we talk fertility. about fertility, which is yeah. a theme that will be discussed in some maternity episodes later yeah, on. Yeah, so. for sure. I mean, one of the questions about genetic engineering that I think really brings us to is this question of what does it mean to be human? What are our values? Because if we are changing the notion of having children to parents picking out features of their children, like when you're buying a car and do you want this or that? are we changing to that? And then that's changing the dynamics of not only the child, but the parent's relationship to the child. And what is the concept of free will in all of that? If we're putting all of our money into genetics, as though, as I mentioned in this, as though a child is like a cake on Pinterest, just some recipe that you put together. You said, Rudy, that you could not stop thinking about this episode. So I'm wondering, what was it that was striking you about this interview? I met somebody else who's clearly way smarter than me because... Uh... Uh, this person's just actually very well accomplished, smart professor. Yeah, Rudy. Oh, on genetic oh, oh, you're not talking about me. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, no, okay. right. Sorry about that. That's good. <laughs> I like that. Uh, who admitted that he too wants to live forever and is also searching for the secret formula and asked to kind of join forces secretly. We're, we're secretly joining forces about perhaps transferring ourselves into a computer or finding whatever the fountain of youth is. I'm clearly borderline crazy. I'm not saying he's crazy. I'm just saying he's got something that I can <laughs> latch on to that some people might think, wow, that's a crazy thought. It was just nice to feel a part of a brotherhood of wanting to live forever. Oh. Okay, with Dr. Michael Vess. And we will link all of his information in the show notes. The book that we are basing this interview on is something that I read a couple years ago. And gosh, I was just so excited when I reached out to him and he said yes to doing this. It's called Our Grandchildren Redesigned. So it's about the ethics of genetic engineering and the possibilities and really reflecting on what this means for our future. So let's talk genetic engineering. I was a philosophy major as an undergrad, and my colleagues keep saying, you're really still a philosopher in disguise. All, all your classes yes. are... 
I'm going to, I'm going to sign off now. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't talk to, I don't talk to philosophers. It's a running joke on the show. Oh, you're outnumbered. I know. When I will, we'll just go ahead and launch in here, but I first became familiar with your book, Our Grandchildren Redesigned Life in the Bioengineered Society of the Near Future from one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Peter Ross, who teaches philosophy of science. Uh, so I got your book a couple of years ago. I really enjoyed it. And it was a surprise when I reached out to you that you're in the history department. So I, can we just back up and say, how did you go from being a philosophy undergrad to then history? How does history and philosophy work and technology in order for you to put this book together? Is it more history? Is it more technology? Is it more philosophy? Part of it involves the history of philosophy. When I was ready to go to graduate school in philosophy 40 years ago, the field in the US and in Britain was dominated by what I call the F of Xers, which is the people who wanted to turn everything into formal logic and try to make formulas for calculating dignity or mm -hmm. you know stuff like that. And it was driving me crazy. I was interested in my my undergraduate thesis was on Hegel. I wanted to continue work in continental philosophy. History attracted me precisely because like philosophy, there's a history of everything. And so it, it didn't chain me to a particular slot of the world. I could study anything I wanted. So in graduate school, that worked really well. And of the books that I've written, the projects that I've undertaken, they've gone all over the map. I'm truly a jack of all trades and master of none. Well, this is something I love that I've actually talked to Rudy about. When we do podcast episodes, one of the things that I think is is disingenuous when people are thinking about what they're going to major in in university is they think if I'm just studying this then I don't need to know anything else and I love topics like this because it's very clear that having an idea of and familiarity with more than one field in this case with this book it's a bit of politics it's a bit of science it's also history and philosophy that all of those things are interlaced it would be impossible to approach genetic engineering from only one of those disciplines I think absolutely or at least it would be really distorting and excessively artificially narrow way of treating it and for me this was exactly what made this appealing to me. I spent 15 years both teaching classes outside you know, my area of expertise, teaching classes on neuroscience or artificial intelligence and working with my students and then reading and reading and reading. So I got to educate myself about stuff like engineering and things that otherwise I would not have been able to spend time on. It took a long time. Was there a class that you were teaching or a conversation that you were having where it kind of clicked, oh, this needs to be a book? Yeah. The, what I've discovered over 30 years of teaching at Vanderbilt is when I bring up the ethical dimension of whatever topic it is that I'm teaching, the students perk up. So I've now sort of automatically, it's where I go anyway, but I have found that when I really put that up front and start asking ethical questions, I have a class on World War II, when I framed it across the ethical dimensions, what are the ethical dilemmas of the good war? The students perk up. They followed me back to my office after class saying, but this, but that, but you forgot this. And what about that? The same applies to this topic. It becomes, I think, exciting and interesting in a whole new way when you are looking at it from the angle of what are the ethical implications of this? What are the assumptions we're making? But then what are the implications? What will be the unintended effects down the line? I love this for my engineering students because I love this topic because a lot of times in engineering ethics, you do case studies. And I don't think that actually studying the case studies, I don't want to completely dismiss them. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think they're actually going to develop the ethical engineer that we want by saying, oh, this happened. That was a disaster. Don't do that. And then memorize what happened and what went wrong. And then you're good to go. Genetic engineering for me is fascinating because we are in the thick of it. So there aren't any clear lines. And as you said here, the traditional moral theories are not all that helpful when it comes to genetic engineering. Right. Could you explain that? Why are the traditional, so for my philosophy majors, why are the traditional moral theories unhelpful when it comes to genetic engineering, the rightness or wrongness of it? There are three possible traditions you could draw upon, mm -hmm. philosophical traditions that you could draw upon. And as you think about putting a moral yardstick on bioenhancement technologies. And so there's the Kantian deontological tradition, there's the Aristotelian, there's the virtue ethics, and there's the consequentialist tradition. What I have found is that when you try to focus exclusively on any one of those, you end up with weird conundrums and contradictions, and you sort of are being drawn to conclusions where you say, I'm not comfortable with that. So I've had to sort of 
fashion my own, I would say, hybrid of all three of those traditions and use that. I think it's very important to have a moral yardstick. And I think this is important for scientists and engineers to understand that, yeah, it's the case study is going to help you with this particular little thing. But, and, and Google is going to say, don't be evil. But that doesn't actually help you in the myriad different situations that you're going to encounter where it's a trade-off, it's a gray area, and you're going to have to find a way to deal with uncomfortably ambiguous or just plain gray area trade-off answers. In the book, I try to sketch very briefly a sort of, uh, and in my classes on this topic, I go into it in a little bit more depth. I draw on all three of those traditions. And the yardstick is human flourishing. First of all, what kind of creature are we? And what does it mean for this kind of creature to flourish? And there's an individual dimension, there's a societal dimension, and I have 10 criteria that I sort of develop by extracting from the literature on this and turn that into a yardstick. And then the idea is for each one, for each type of modification, a pharmaceutical, or some pill that you're going to be popping to boost this or bioelectronic implant that you're going to be using or a genetic or epigenetic modification that you're going to be undertaking. What am I going to be trying to accomplish with this? How's it going to change me? And then the question is, what's the yardstick? How's it going to change me as a whole? That holistic approach is really important. It, not just what additional things will I be able to do, but how will that refract through the totality of my lived experience and my flourishing? And then when millions of people adopt it at the societal level, how will that play out? What you realize is very quickly, a seemingly utterly benign on the surface of it modification, for example, doubling the human health span. So we could all live strong, vigorous, mentally alert lives to age 160. That sounds pretty terrific for most people. I think it's uncontroversial. I'm not adding wings or some you know, superpowers. I'm just living twice as long in a very healthy way. But when you start actually sitting down and saying, how is that going to play out for my identity as an individual? How is that going to affect my flourishing? How is it going to affect the flourishing of my society when millions of people are doing it? You start to realize even that very conceptually simple modification, if it could ever come about, would turn many aspects of our society utterly upside down and turn a lot of the sense of who we are upside down. The stages of life would become completely different. When do you stop being educated? When do you stop you know, your education and start the work phase of your life? somebody works hard and becomes a CEO by age 50, then do they stay in that position for another 90 years because they're perfectly physically and mentally capable of doing it? Well, what happens to the company when one person stays in that position? What happens to the generations as they sort of coexist together? Could a 30-year-old fall in love with a 130-year-old? And all these very interesting questions suddenly arise when you start thinking through the consequences of a seemingly very benign bio-enhancement. Oh, what would happen in the military That's when another. you're supposed to serve or this or that i don't know and then in this would if that kind of enhancement happened i guess is the presupposition that that would be global or is it who has their hands on it oh my gosh there's so many questions all bio enhancements are going to have the very clear possibility of exacerbating the gap between haves and have not both within a country, even within a rich country like the United States, and on a global scale. So that's one of the immediate big problems that bioenhancement technologies are going to create that we're going to have to find a way to solve. So I guess one of my, Rudy, Rudy's like soaking all this up, I can tell. I just have... I have one question that I think it might be a bit tangential. This is something that's kind of bothering me about genetic engineering. Is it, and I mean by bother, keeping me up at night, is genetic engineering presupposing that we don't have a soul? Because if you are, let's just say if you're parents and you want to work on the embryo, it's almost as though you're treating the child like a cake from a Pinterest recipe. If you do all of these ingredients, which means that there's this presupposition that the human being is 100% material. And I noticed in your book that there was this caution about eugenics, which eugenics presupposed that the human being was material because that's the only explanation that you would have for why some somebody should no longer exist or somebody should be no longer reproduce. Yeah. Is genetic engineering in some way presupposing that there's not a soul? Are yeah, we getting think, rid of the notion of the soul? I think at some level, the cruder versions of eugenics, there's the atrocious, openly, clearly, obviously versions, the atrocious versions like the eugenics that the Nazis carried out or that were carried out in the United States before World War II. 
Then there's a new form of eugenics that's dubbed itself liberal eugenics, which says it's not going to be the state controlling who gets to be selected for. It's going to be the market. Let people modify themselves, choose their modifications as they wish. The invisible hand of that process will result in overall beneficial outcomes, and we should have the freedom to modify our own bodies and minds in any way we want. You mentioned the Pinterest and the cake. The first thing that you see with this is the commodity of humans. You see that I become in some level equivalent to the chicken that I'm about to buy at Whole Foods, where I can take this one and take that one. And this one is, you know, a grade five, which was raised in a certain type of organic farm. This one isn't and has these qualities. It'll taste this way. And you're just measuring these two entities as a commodity. And suddenly, when you enter the bioenhancement framework, not just genetics, pharmaceuticals and bioelectronic implants have the same sort of underlying current. You're treating people like products, like commodities, and you're then reducing them to the sum total of whatever they can do and saying, well, then they can be compared like a, one car versus another, like one chicken versus another. There's a deep violation you mentioned the word soul. There's a deep violation of human dignity implicit there. The word soul is an interesting one because it's fraught with religious overtones, but it doesn't have to be. There's a secular understanding of the soul or a secular understanding of human consciousness or the human nature that doesn't have to rely on that religious notion that there's a soul that gets in, breathed into you and that you exhale at the end of your life and you go on to some afterlife. There's a purely secular version, which is, rooted in the philosophical concept of emergence, emergent properties of things coming together in a way that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I think it applies to the human brain. It applies to phenomena in the natural world. You don't have to bring in transcendent or supernatural qualities. It definitely applies to human beings. We are these dual creatures who are existing simultaneously on a material plane, but out of the material plane emerges all this complex of qualities that then also define us just as basically as the fact that we are always biological organisms. So dignity, community, all the ethical dimensions and intrinsic value, friendship, love, the things that make a life worth living, those aren't answerable at the material level. They're sort of providing some of the basics, but out of that emerges this other dimension that's so important to our being. We're dual creatures. And yet, Bioenhancement technologies like genetics allow us to manipulate the material substrate in a way that then profoundly affects the upper level. I, I'm using upper as a metaphor here, the emergent level, and then turns the whole of it into some, a, a commodity. It's a reduction that does great violence to the totality of who we are. Something that I've never... Ugh. I don't want to say never. The only time I've ever heard of a secular form of a soul or some kind of secular explanation of life after what we call death, somebody had once told me, and if you believe that energy, once energy is set into motion, cannot stop in motion, it continues to go forward, life is energy. And when you die, just that energy changes form into another form of energy. And that sat with me for a couple of years and um, let me get off of whatever ledge I was on. Because uh, Michael, I, if you've ever listened to any of the episodes here, I have, I have, I've got a lot of problems. <laughs> and one of them, and, and I know you don't have a lot of time, and this is not a psychological <laughs> session, a session, but uh, I do like to hear about in genetic engineering, anything that can help me live for 3 million years, I'm always going to open up my ears because I don't want to die. I really enjoy a life. I really enjoy having podcasts. I really enjoy learning. I really enjoy these things. And yes, last night I had another nightmare. Uh, last night's nightmare was I was sinking in quicksand and I woke up just as the quicksand was going into my mouth and I woke up and I was alive and I, I felt really good, <laughs> but I, I'm going off on a Any tangent. Any psychoanalysts here, but, out there, please feel yeah, free so, to I sound contact. Like a crazy person. I know I sound like a crazy person. <laughs> Good as in the details pod no, at gmail.com. <laughs> no, but seriously, the whole secular concept of a soul, I've barely heard of that before. By the way, Gwen and I went to Catholic school our whole lives. That also plays a theme throughout uh, this podcast. So there's my fear of death. There's Catholicism. There's me looking for some kind of secular soul stuff. Um, you could say character. I am a character. That's no. a whole other... What's 
I don't. The I don't have character. I don't have you. the non-physical aspect. So the, I, the character, in lieu of a soul, that would be a way of a secular. That's another possibility because so somebody, let's say, who's atheist does not even believe in an afterlife. They would still make the case that character is of more value than your physical self. That that is really what makes you you. One of the ways I heard it described was from a Buddhist monk. It was this looking at it in terms of consciousness that your brain was like the orchestra and consciousness was the music that came from it. You it's alter beautiful. one of the, yeah, it's always stuck with it. I don't even remember who said it or I know it was a Buddhist monk. I don't even remember the book or anything, but it is always stuck with me. Does it have to be an orchestra? Cause I, I'm a real punk rock fan. Can it be any kind of, cause then <laughs> things like, like chaos, I'm K, is it okay to have chaos as your soundtrack? Okay. I'm going to throw something out that's going to be for both of you because I kind of have this legal question about some of the ramifications. What if we got to a point where it would be wrong to not enhance or use genetic engineering? So in the same way that let's say a parents could be held accountable, maybe morally, I'm not sure about legally, but if they are denying a child a particular type of medical treatment that would save their life. Could you see it advancing to a point a parent could be held accountable for not ensuring a type of enhancement? And what kind of thing could you picture that being? I don't mean it would be blue eyes, but let's just say, I don't know, maybe a medical issue or something like that you find out about the embryo. I want to jump in because I want to add a little bit more on top of this for Michael because I want to hear Michael's answer and respond to you. Gwen, we have plenty of parents out there. I have plenty of friends that are divorced parents that are fighting with their partner because one of the parents won't allow the child to get vaccinated. Different levels of engineering, different levels of what we're talking about here, medical, adding something foreign into the body in order to protect yourself. So like, I don't even know how we can even get to answering your question without even getting to, well, what are the moral implications of not allowing a child to get vaccinated? because we're still in the middle of a pandemic. We've got Omicron hanging out out there and these issues are happening. I have friends, male and female, reaching out to me for legal advice. I'm like, look, I'm not a family law attorney. Go contact a family law attorney. You figure that out. But that's a very, very, very tricky issue that the courts don't want to get involved with. No, I mean, these are all really basic points. It comes back for me to the question of how one is defining flourishing, how one is using that yardstick to measure a particular modification. And here I encountered a really interesting debate that's out there, a philosophical debate in the community of deaf people. It turns out that mm -hmm. some deaf people people feel that they have a special community that it has given them access to flavors and levels of reality that the hearing cannot access. They've formed a community that's precious to them. And so if there's a deaf couple and they, and they have a child, the child in many cases for medical reasons can be born with hearing, but that child would be excluded from participating in this special group of people, the special community of those who have impaired hearing for whatever reason. And so then there's an ethical question, right? Can they introduce a modification that removes the hearing from that child for the purpose of allowing that child to be included in this beautiful community of people that the parents belong to? It's a disenhancement in the sense. You're taking away a quality that that child would otherwise have had. But there's an ethically interesting argument that it's compensated for by being part of a, a vibrant community that in many ways gives meaning to a person's life in many other ways. Language, myself, culture, yeah. yeah. So I think when it comes to a very straightforward avoidance of suffering, for example, if we come up with the COVID vaccine is a, one very clear example today. I think it's actually think it's unethical not to get vaccinated because of the herd immunity. You're not just affecting yourself. You're affecting the broader community of humankind, and you're becoming an incubating point for the virus to continue mutating if you uh, are breaking yourself open to catching it, even if you don't die from it. I think that's pretty clear. Let's say that an enhancement were to come into being a genetic modification or an epigenetic modification that doubled your resistance to many forms of cancer. Would it be ethical to refuse that to your child? My feeling is no, it would not be ethical just as it's not ethical. If you can send your child to school, well, you want your child to flourish in the sense of being able to, you know, in the Aristotelian terms, realize all your innate faculties. This is mm -hmm. what it means for a human to flourish, or at least one aspect of it. So being educated and being healthy, these are basic rights. 
And for parents to willfully exclude a child from that strikes me as ethically problematic. Gosh, Where that's it gets so interesting. Is with intelligence. Yeah. And things like intelligence are tricky, or physical, let's say, physical stamina in the sense of being able to run marathons or play basketball better, or you know, things like that. And here you mention in your email the the work of Michael Sandel, who's talking about the problem with perfection. And Sandel's argument is a philosopher, and a, I guess he's a philosopher at Harvard. He says we. Well, there's something really important about learning to accept what is given to us and appreciate it for what it is as a totality, which will include limitations and flaws. This is the important part about the givenness of each of us. Each of us has strengths and weaknesses, limitations and, and capabilities. And when you have a child, part of loving that child unconditionally means taking them for the wholeness of who they are and then working with that child as, in, as intelligently and benevolently as you can to help that child bring forth whoever they are as fully as possible. One argument would be, well, if they can be smarter, then they'll compete better in the world. They'll be able to accomplish more things that they want to accomplish. It's not just a question of making more money or, or something like that. It's also you could have an intrinsic argument that intelligence is an intrinsically good thing and say, yeah, they'll be able to appreciate Beethoven more if they're smarter or they'll have a, a richer life. So you can make that type of argument. But the problem with that type of argument is you're going down the line of reducing a person to their capabilities and, yeah. and so, sort of measuring them that way. And so we're back to the chicken and the car where you're sort of saying you're a commodity. I have the power to shape you. And where do you stop that? One of the other unintended effects of if you start on this treadmill of boosting capabilities, where does it end? Because today's upgrade, let's, it's like computers, right? Computers go through their little generations and then you have to get a, a completely, or iPhones, you have to get a, the latest model and it totally blows away the characteristics of the older models. So you're kind of compelled eventually to upgrade. And then a little bit later, that one has become obsolete and what was cutting edge becomes old and obsolete. And now it has to be updated to the next model. And so you get sort of humans XP, you know, humans seven, humans 10. And where does that end? You're starting to talk about humans in the same way that we talk about machines, about commodities, products. And Sandel's argument is very much about rejecting that, falling into that trap of commodification. And bioenhancement inherently takes us in that direction where we start to say, that person sure is a lot better in all these different ways than this other person. That's a dangerous place to go because now you're in the direction of eugenics. Yeah, you know, we read the case against perfection for my engineering ethics class. And I always ask the students after the semester's over, and let's just say you go to your parents' place and I don't know, you're looking for something in one of the drawers and you open the drawer and you find that it is a receipt for you, that everything in that receipt is a description of you. How would you feel about that? Would it would it alter the way in which you view your parents, your life, your choices, everything? Some of them say, I would say thank you because they did a great job. You know, it, But it's an interesting question of what is it you're paying for? So for Sandel, the idea is if you're beneath a baseline of health, then any kind of engineering to get you to that baseline is fine. But then after that, something that he writes in his book that has really, really stuck with me is that people might spend money on this genetic enhancement as an expression of their perception of freedom. I have all this money. This is going to be my baby. So I can pay all of this. This is freedom. And he says, it's actually the biggest form of disempowerment because you're using all of your money to pay for an idea of perfection that you did not create to, in order for them to fit in. And the very thing that makes us human is that somebody is an outlier. So why would you put all of this money into having your child not be the outlier? And I thought that was so interesting. Absolutely. And that never ends. What I mean, this you mentioned Buddhism earlier. One of the lessons that I've really gleaned from Buddhism is that type of thinking puts you on a treadmill that never ends. And it's the proverbial will of the wisp. It keeps receding as you pursue it. And you're never going to get there. You're never going to get to the perfection in, that, that Sandel's referring to in his title. And ultimately, from what little I've been able to put together of practical wisdom in my life, I've seen that that's a losing game. It doesn't lead to fulfillment. Fulfillment comes from the relationships that we have now. The way that I can relate to a tree today, just standing in front of it and seeing it for what it is in all of its 
complexity and imperfection. And certainly in my relationship with my family, with my friends, with my students, with total stranger at the gas station, can I bring to that moment a sense of wholeness? and acceptance and communion, or at least seeking communion. That's a very different way of thinking than this way of thinking, how can I get more, 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 more capabilities, faster powers? That seems to me to be a treadmill that 2,500 years of philosophy has taught us to be wary of. Yeah, the whole history of philosophy would teach, this is just from Socrates, that the good life, I mean, in all the history of philosophy and even, uh, you know, religious theory, that the goodness in life comes from a development of the soul or of character above and beyond the body and the material things. It doesn't, it's just a more than, it doesn't mean they're mutually exclusive, but this whole technology is taking us in a different direction of that, um, where there is more evidence to suggest that we'll make life good are these like you said, these intrinsic qualities, this enhancement of a soul or a character. And it just seems to be reversed. And it's just, it's bothering me. I mean, there's, there's all these, first of all, parents already put a lot of hopes and dreams and everything into their child from how they name them, how they're going to decorate their room. And I just can't imagine putting all of this money and there's not a guarantee that your child is actually going to turn out the way in which you're trying to put all these ingredients in like they're a Pinterest cake. And what does that automatically do to the relationship? And I don't know, can you sue the person? You're like, I wanted my child to be a musician. You promised me this gene would do it. And then they're not, you know, or you promised me this would give them blue eyes and it didn't, or you promised me this, they would be this tall and they're not just that kind of complexity with the relationship that the child would have with the parents that they were paid for to have certain talents. I I don't know. But then some people might say, well, you do that anyway when you put your kids in soccer and your music or whatnot. Are you thinking that, Rudy? You do that anyway? No, no, it's a fine line, right? I mean, you know, here I am, you know, Mr. Uh, There is no, like, finite answer. Wait, wait, are you going to say there's no answer? He teaches me all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. never have an answer. There's no answer on this. I am glad this is being recorded. (laughs) Good. For example, if your child has any kind of developmental disabilities, like that they didn't start speaking until late, like me, right? I didn't start speaking until I was two and a half. Back in the 70s, you know, my mom took me to the doctor and they said, he's not talking. They're like, don't worry about it. He'll be fine. You know, these days, your kid's not talking. They're not saying five to six words by 18 months. And the pediatrician's on top of you saying, okay, well, here's, you have to go enter your kid into this special service through the county and they're behind on this. And there's all these like minimum things that you got to hit. It's an evolution. Would you be remiss as a parent if you weren't following what the pediatrician suggested? There's all, I mean, it's all different grades and and levels here. Putting a kid into soccer is like, I put both my kids into soccer because I want them to learn team sports. I want them to learn how to socialize. I want them to learn how to lose properly. I want them to learn how to win properly. I want them to learn how to, you know, have a set schedule on the weekends. There's so much much more to going into putting kids into sports, especially from somebody like me who's terrible at sport. My kids are genetically screwed sports wise. So like I have very, 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 very low expectations of them. I, I, have, I have higher expectations of them in music because I did music for many years and I love music and I see, I see what I think is talent in my kids, but there's no guarantees by spending thousands upon thousands of dollars and, and hours upon hours sending them to that. I'm much more realistic that way. I think the vast majority of parents are. However, I do see parents who didn't accomplish all of the things that they wanted to in their life. They definitely force that down upon their children. They spend the money on it. They hire the coaches. They will cut any corner that's humanly possible. That brings up a whole host of other issues whereby if we start messing around with genetic engineering, genetic enhancement, genetic anything, you know some parents are going to think, well, you know, Johnny next door is getting his his genetic uh, shot today to get his XYZ, I don't know, power or what enhancement or whatever it is. Well, you know, I don't want my kid to be behind Johnny. I got to get my kids the shot or there's so there's just tons of issues here that it's not that simple uh, of of an answer. And and one other thing, while while you were talking, Michael, this might seem out there. Okay. But 
it's very clear that a very popular genre of film that starts from when kids are very, very young and, you know, God bless them, Disney and Marvel and all these companies, they've really brought in the superhero into our life, right? If you go, and we've done a couple of podcast episodes on superheroes, I mean, the reality is the vast majority of those superheroes were genetically advanced. I mean, they just were, whether it's from some alien planet or whether it's some experiment or something. And so superheroes and superpowers and being able to do things that are superhuman, every human being is seeing that all day, every day throughout the world. It's kind of like this strange, like, what is the impact of that, right? I mean, yes, it's just a movie or yes, it's just a TV show. But okay, but what if you can be a a little bit more like Spider-Man or a little bit more like Superman or a little bit more like Thor? It's an interesting question. What about steroids? Um, Steroids is an enhancement. You can still go out and get steroids these days, notwithstanding the fact that there are many, 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 many medical negatives that come from that. You can still go out there and do that. It all comes down to regulation. It all comes down to what is acceptable for we as a society that we're going to live with. I'm curious what your thoughts are about on explosion of superhero movies and whether or not that has a lasting impact on us. I was listening to you talking. I was thinking, harking back to what you were saying earlier about not wanting to die. And yeah, I'm with you on that. I'd like to have a doubled health span. I'd like, there's so much that I still want to do and learn and experience and share with other people. A lot of these enhancements are going to be very hard to say no to. Why? Well, because there actually are aspects of life that we do value. Like if I could be rejuvenated, I'd sign on in a second. Uh, me too. Me too, man. Me too. If you get an opportunity, you better call me. I'm, I'm serious about it. <laughs> well, I'll share it with you. That's the, the complicated part is you can't put a blanket generalization and say, no, don't do this at all. Or yeah, we should be able to do anyone we want. It's really a case by case. And each one has to be embedded in that ethical question about what do we really want to make of ourselves? Every single modification. If I can make myself a, a little bit, have a better memory, a little bit physically stronger, a little bit longer lived. Yeah, why not? I don't see a problem with that. But how does it come together as a whole? That's a question we need to keep asking. No joke. Right before the show, I was doing a little bit of research investigation. I just saw something that says Viagra may help with Alzheimer's disease. And I'm like, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. This, this, is, this is this is a joke. I read the article. It was in a medical journal and I'm not, I'm not on Viagra right now. But I'm telling you, they find out like, hey, you start taking taking that in your mid 40s you'll yeah. be good. I'm in. That's well, it. Yeah, I okay. mean, I'm just saying. Let me throw something in there. The show Black Mirror, I think, did an interesting thought experiment about memory. That this idea of a memory enhancement might sound great, but there was an episode where you could get a chip into memory, you know, to have memory and you could project that memory up on a wall. Did you see it, Michael? Do you know what I'm talking about, by any chance? Yeah. And what the show did was it showed the, are you looking it up, Brittany? It showed after a while that the horror of how having such a perfect memory and being able to relive and you actually end up having an appreciation for the way that we are designed or the way that we are maybe i should be careful about the language i use there the way that we function is that you are not supposed to remember everything that that would be an absolute hell so that's what i'm wondering with some of these enhancements if there's this idea that we're not even recognizing that it actually might be a survival trait it might be actually a strength that you don't remember everything that's part of your survival Bible. But I also want to throw in, I'm wondering, maybe I'm kind of back to the question of what we're imposing on children. In your research, are there reinforced gender stereotypes when it comes to enhancement? Or is it across the board? Do all parents say, boy or girl, I want them to be smart. Boy or girl, I want them to be tall. Is there anything going on there? One of the things that all forms of enhancement will reflect are the prejudices of each society at its particular moment in time that will be projected into the forms of enhancements that get wide, widely adopted. So in China, in the 19, maybe even today, but certainly 20 years ago, where there was a clear preference for male children. They were enforcing back then a, a one-child policy. When parents found out that they had a daughter on the way, they were aborting that child. And when they found out that they were having having a boy, they would keep that child. Just one example. In that society, there was a cultural preference for boys. The result is right now a very skewed demographics in the Chinese
Chinese population, there's significantly more boys than girls. Okay, so racial stereotypes, class stereotypes, and gender stereotypes, these have been integral parts of our society through history. They've changed and shaped over time. Whatever happened to be the stereotypes and prejudices that people hold at the moment when they make their enhancement choices, that will reflect and shape the way they go. If it's blonde, blue-eyed males, you know, if it's Hitler's Germany, that's what everybody's going to want to become. So you're going to have trait fads. People actually have ability to select it. You're going to see a reinforcement, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy of and a self-aggravating cycle of people shaping their children and themselves in the direction of the cultural prejudices. I think that's but, what scares me. Michael, you know what else has been going on? Um, you're probably fully aware of this. It's huge. I mean, not a huge thing, but a lot of parents, uh, when you're talking about the little cheats, the little legal cheats, a lot of parents are keeping their kids behind because uh, it helps out with sports teams. If you've got a kid that's on the cusp, whether it's July or August, you keep them behind. And it kind of makes sense in a way because kids that were born earlier in the year, January, February, just grow. I mean, it, it's just genetics. It's just biology. It's just just kind of how it is. And so it's like it's really interesting that like I, I really feel like over time, we're going to have kids graduating a lot later. And then what are the ripple effects of that as a society? I mean, obviously we're talking about genetic engineering, but we're, we've also been talking about the other kind of cheats that are there today. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It's a good example with genetic modification. Right now, every one of us is partially shaped by our genes and partially shaped by the environment in which we grew up, our family and the culture around us. And there's a very complex dance through which we get shaped over time. But the genetic component, yeah, there is a little bit of shaping that is taking place by the fact that your parents chose each other and not someone else. So there was some shaping there. But your parents didn't really have any say once they got together in designing you. They then have a great deal of say after you're born in deciding what kind of school they want to put you, what type of city you want to live in, what type of school to send you to, what type of things to teach you to do or not do at home. Huge say. What's coming over the horizon with CRISPR and these new technologies, epigenetic modifications, now the parents are going to actually be able to have a much more direct say in the genetic component that makes us who we are. So what does that mean? The example that I use here is another Buddhist story. It's a, a Buddhist monk sees a canoe coming down. He's in a canoe crossing a river and an empty canoe comes down and bumps into his canoe. And he yells at it and says, damn canoe, why did you do that to me? And it's meant to show the absurdity of blaming something that actually had no personhood or decision or moral responsibility behind it. Right now, we can't really blame anything except sort of fate for our genetic makeup. And you certainly can't blame your parents. They didn't shape you. But once genetic engineering starts to become a common practice, suddenly that canoe that bumps into you has somebody in it who was steering it and was either responsible for avoiding you or negligent in crashing into you, now children will be able to look back at their parents and say, you gave me piano. I don't care about piano. I wanted to learn how to be an athlete. Why did you do that to me? I, I have no interest in this. Or worse still, I love piano, but is it really me? Or is that, am I just playing out your preferences that, like you were saying earlier, Rudy, am I just sort of an instrument to complete your dreams? And where does that leave my authenticity, my sense of who I am. I'm just an instrument to fulfill your dreams and desires. Why did you do this to me? There's a lot to, a lot to unpack here. There's a I lot, know. right? There's just <laughs> so the much. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. No, Michael, this has been such a lovely conversation. I'm just, I know Rudy's right. There's so much. <laughs> I think there's something I do have a question about is that you said that in coming together with this book, that it resulted from a lot of lectures and interactions with your students and they enjoyed the moral questions. So I'm curious, Curious, given that your students would be, you know, 18, 19, 20, and over the years, have they had a point of view about genetic engineering that you thought was interesting, that's different from, you know, your education, your background, your age, and here you have these, you know, the youth coming in, and do they look at it differently, or are you guys aligned, or did they say something and you thought, oh, I didn't think about it that way? I'm kind of curious if you learned something from your students about this topic. Well, I certainly learn a ton from my students because they're constantly raising questions that I hadn't seen uh, and forcing me to 
then go back and revisit my assumptions. I don't think our society has advanced far along enough yet with genetic engineering that a 20-year-old is going to be that different in terms of the effects that they're seeing in, in society compared to what I experienced. 20 years from now, as the CRISPR stuff starts to really come into the... Right now it's being CRISPR and other genetic modifications are being used in the animal world and in the plant world with increasing effectiveness. 20 years from now, you're going to actually, I think, see a very different situation because then young people will be growing up in families where questions that are right now sort of philosophical and hypothetical have become very real. What do we do? As you were saying, Rudy, the people next door have modified their kid with traits A, B, and C. Are we going to do that or not? Are we going to keep up with the Joneses? Are we not going to keep up with the Joneses? What are our family values around this? That's going to be suddenly become much more pressing. So I think right now I'm not seeing it so much because genetic modification of humans is not a reality. And I don't feel that far apart from my students. I feel far apart when it comes to online stuff because <laughs> they've grown up in an internet rich and screen rich world. Mm -hmm. So I yell at them and I say, when I walk from one building to another between classes, I have to like keep avoiding stepping aside because I keep getting run into by students who are <laughs> glued to their screens. And I say, can you please at least be a little bit more aware of what you're doing to yourself with your screens? You've basically adopted this cell phone into your identity and now you've become a screen addict but you're you're not seeing the day around you you're not seeing the people around you the beautiful trees it's a beautiful campus stop for a second and just think about it before you go back to answering that really pressing email not, not email it's probably going to be it's, a snapchat okay. okay. yeah no i always wondered there would be that i was wondering when there would be that moment when i realized that i was on the other side in terms of age and understanding that something would happen and i think it was the the notion of the need for the cell phone. The other moment when it happened, when I realized, okay, I am of a different generation than my students, they can't read my writing. And it's not because my writing is messy. It's because I write in cursive and they don't know that. And I thought, oh my God, they don't, we don't learn how to write the same way. And I told them that all of their printing on their exams looks like the writing of a serial killer. So, <laughs> so there, yeah. but um, yeah, no, you're right with, with the screens. I, you know, I try to tell them, you know, there was a time when and you would walk out of class and you would just walk to the next building and be lost in your own thoughts and go ahead and do that so you can find out what you think about something. Let your mind just wander. And yeah. when I tell my students that, they look at me as if I were saying, yeah, there was a time when we used leeches to, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, increase our health. They laugh and kind of mm -hmm. in a sort of patronizing way, they sort of say, okay, yeah, old guy, you know, it's okay. <laughs> but I do think that it's a pathology, actually. We have to be careful with the screens and people are now becoming aware. Social media and self-image and the youth and the teenagers and the suicides. Now we're start to understand there's more to this than meets the eye. And that's a form of bioenhancement already. Yeah. I presented a paper that was on the notion of character and image and that we seem to have confused the two when it comes to social media, thinking that image is the same thing as character. And yeah, and it's not. That's one of my concerns with it. Hey, is this going to be your next book, Michael? Are you going to be talking about social media and screens? No, my next book is about the four biggest dangers facing humankind and what we can do about them. Is aliens on the list? Because Rudy is scared of aliens. No aliens. It's mostly <laughs> ourselves that I need to be. Do you got a better sense of what what you're uh, what you, who you're dealing with, Michael? <laughs> that you're dealing. You are actually dealing with a crazy person. Uh, no joke. An actual one. <laughs> oh, welcome no, to the club. Some of this, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about you, Rudy, because it was for my engineering class. I think something came up where I was just frustrated about people not wanting to get vaccinated or wear a mask, and I'm just like, oh my god, if aliens land. And we are not in charge anymore. We are, we're, we're done. We're done. If aliens land, they're not going to look at us and say, you're the superior ones. I'm all in favor of aliens landing because that'll be the only thing that finally unites humankind. <laughs> I saw that movie. We badly need to be reunited with each other. So yeah, I'm all in favor of the alien invasion. You know, I saw Independence Day. Good movie. Uh, it did unite us for a bit. Much like 9-11 united us for yeah. a little, little, little tiny bit. But exactly. you know, sooner or later, the other, no matter who that other is and you yeah. we all unite against that other at the end of the day you know what human beings are just we're just way too different um we we have to we all have to learn to get along with in some way shape or form yeah i don't know 
and appreciate that. appreciate the differences like mm-hmm. like a symphony yeah you know what that's a great way to kind of end the show we you know we could all genetically engineer ourselves to be like each other and have the same quote unquote powers or abilities or everybody or we could just appreciate how awesome being different is and that we all being different being crazy being you know being a little out there being fearful of things it makes the world a little bit more interesting well michael rudy has fantastic hair rudy if everybody had fabulous hair then you wouldn't have fabulous hair you would just have hair it's true that's what i mean that's the whole (laughs) point i mean i make up for all my deficiencies mentally which there's a lot i mean the list my you have there's not enough time to talk about the mental deficiencies but the hair i kick ass at it oh it's kind of as if we discovered that it was was not viagra but rogaine that you know, you know you, you, you'd think you know looking at the people in my family you'd think like where you know how it is how does he keep it i keep it because of will i actually have a superpower i willed myself to say i will never lose my hair and it stayed and because my hair knows i will kick its ass if it ever tries to get off of my head i think that's basically what it comes down to threats um, are very useful that way. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. This, this was lovely. I appreciate really this. this. This was great. It was fun. Thanks a lot, Michael. This was great. Thank you, guys. Good is in the Details is produced by Dr. Gwendolyn Dolsky and Rudy Salo. If you have any questions about this episode or any other episodes, you can get in touch on Facebook and Instagram, Good is in the Details Pod, or email us at goodisinthedetailspod at gmail.com. Much thanks to Dr. Bess for kicking off our season three. This was just a great, great conversation. Okay, until next time, bye.